So this is the, uh, the, the fourth Advent message, and um, the title of it is Good News of Great Joy. And I really do want to try to focus our attention on the, the, the whole uh, Christmas story and the meaning of Christmas. And in our first Advent message, we, we uh, saw that uh, the, the people of Israel were in spiritual and moral darkness, and Isaiah promised that a great light would pierce the darkness. In, in Malachi, we, we saw that after the exile, so, so think about it, God told them that he was going to judge Israel, and then they were going to come back to the promised land. And then the prophets started saying, look, when you come back, there's going to be these tremendous blessings. And, and in Malachi, which is almost 100 years after the return of Israel into the promised land, uh, these promises have not been fulfilled. They're, they're languishing, and, and the, the people are saying, um, you know, where is this promise? Is God going to keep his promises? And it just seemed like there's these unfulfilled promises from God. And then last week we were encouraged by the, the greatness of God through that beautiful song of Mary, weren't we? The, called the Magnificat. And, and it was a characteristic of someone who celebrates Christmas properly. And the main, primary uh, characteristic is that they have humility. And humility, we learned, is thinking properly of ourselves. And the only way for us to think properly of ourselves is to think of who we are in light of who God is. Isn't that true? I mean, He's great, and, and, and we're not. And He's holy, and we're not. And all these sort of things. But the greatest picture of humility, and one that we can use to celebrate Christmas properly, is to see the God of the heavens in a manger. Have you ever thought about that? Uh, you know, there's that song, Mary, Did You Know? And it goes into all the, 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 the questions and the awe and the wonderment of, of here's this mother with this uh, baby boy in her arms. And, and God in the manger should shatter us of all of our arrogance. In the passage that we're going to see today, we're going to see God in His holiness. In fact, this whole section of Scripture, lowliness, is the most prominent feature of this passage. Uh, some, lowliness is something that accompanied the shepherds through their entire lives. And if you look at the very first verse that was read today, verse number 8, Luke 2, 8, says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. Now what region are we talking about? Well, if you back at the verse number four, we learn that it's a region around Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is, is really close to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, if you stand on the Mount of Olives, which is across from the, the Temple Mount, you can see Bethlehem from the Mount of Olives. And you can see uh, parts of Jerusalem, the outskirts of Jerusalem from Bethlehem. It's, it's that close. It's only about six miles or so from Jerusalem. And so... They're in the, the region of, of Bethlehem. And I want you to notice something about the announcement. The very first pronouncement, not the prediction, but the very first pronouncement of the ver birth of the Messiah was to shepherds. Shepherds. In our, in our classless society, we have a hard time grasping this. But if you've spent any time studying history or studying other cultures, you realize that m the, most of the cultures in the world have distinct classes. In India, they have the caste system, and you, you never rise out of your caste. In England, it used to be that you could, uh, you could be in a class, and it didn't matter your, how much education you had or how much money you had. You never moved out of that class, even though you know, your circumstances may have changed. So we have a hard time. And plus, we don't have an honor-shame society. As a matter of fact, in our society, there really is no shame, is there? Uh, there's not much shame in anything other than maybe believing in God and, and having and morals in our society, but we won't go there. But the shepherds, the shepherds were outsiders. They were, they were outcasts in society. And this, it is to this group that the angels first appeared. And it says, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Now, if you come uh, Tuesday night, I'm going to read these verses out of the King James. Do you remember what it says in the King James? The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were what? Sore afraid, right? Um, but they were filled with great fear. 
Why were they filled with fear? Well, I think we can safely assume that this whole scene in itself was frightening. You're, you're a shepherd there. There's no night lights. Uh, there was no lights of the town or the city. It's a completely dark landscape. Uh, probably, most likely, it was starry that night. Who knows? And, and all of a sudden, uh, this pitch black countryside is pierced with, the darkness is pierced with the glory of God in all its splendor. And, and it's, we can't even comprehend it. Do you know that one of the primary descriptions of, of what God looks like, if I can use that, that little phrase, is light? That's one of the primary descriptions of God. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Um, the Bible says that He dwells in unapproachable light. And every time in Scripture man experiences the brightness of the glory of God, he falls down in fear. And so the shepherds were afraid because of the, the, this natural uh, phenomena that they're seeing of, of seeing God in light. But furthermore, when you go into the life of Jesus in Matthew 17, you see when Jesus was transfigured and it says, and he was transfigured before them and his face shone as the sun and his clothes became white as light. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what it is going to be like one day to see the transfigured Son of God? In, in inapproachable light. If you remember, Moses communed with God on Mount Sinai, and when he came down, that, that uh, glory of the Lord was on his face, and the Bible says that he covered his face with a veil because the people were afraid when they saw how his face shone by the glory of God. And so God, God is, is primarily, one of the primary descriptions of him is light. Think about the conversion of Paul in Damascus, on the road to Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground. The, when Jesus appeared to Paul, Saul at that time, it, it didn't say, there was no physical description of Jesus. It, look at what it says. This is all it says. Suddenly a light. And so the glory of the Lord is this light like you've never seen before. But I think the second reason that they fell down in fear, they were, the shepherds were afraid, is because that's a natural response to seeing the glory of God in comparison to the human condition. In, in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw the Lord in the temple, and here's his response. His response isn't, his response isn't, oh, this is awesome, dude, or whatever you want to say. He didn't, he didn't say, hey, everybody come here. Rather, his response was, woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of an unclean lips. And why did he say that? There's a four in that verse. And the four is this. He says, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When sinful people are thrust into the presence of a holy God, it makes their situation much clearer. And don't miss this. The shepherds know that they are unclean. And when they're placed in the presence of God, they're keenly aware that they are not worthy to be there. And so fear grips them. Because what should follow, what always followed humanity who was unclean before the Lord and, and there was no mediator, what follows is destruction. And we see this uh, in, in the book of Revelation. When Christ comes in all His glory, the only ones that are saved are, are those who happen to believe in Christ as their Savior. Those who do not, it's, it's their immediate destruction when the glory of the Lord comes there. Do you remember what God said? God told Moses, you cannot see me because if you see me, what will happen? Anybody who sees me will die. That's the glory of the Lord. And they understood that what should follow is their destruction for they cannot dwell in the presence of God. But then in the midst of this fear, knowing that this is going to be their natural reaction, the angel says what? Very next verse. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Why shouldn't they fear? What's the antidote? It's right there. I bring you good news of great joy. 
It's not, I'm bringing you the message of your destruction. It's, I'm bringing you the good news. Now, what do you think about when you think of the term good news from the Bible? Yeah. Yeah, good news. The word in the original is euangelio or euangelion if you use a noun form. And we would say it's the um, gospel or we would say to evangelize. It's transliterated to mean evangelize. To evangelize. And and um, that's, that's really cool. But I want to teach you something about that little word. For centuries before the coming of Jesus Christ, and this is important in the context, for centuries before the coming of Jesus Christ, good news was a military term. Did you know that? It was, it was good news was always associated with the military. As a matter of fact, I was doing some research this week, uh, Philo of Alexandria uh, used the term to describe good, the good news of military victories. Josephus, the Jewish historian, was the same. He used the term good news to describe the, the victory in battle that the people would have. And the idea is that a nation is in battle, and when they have won, they send a messenger back to the city to herald the good news. It's, it's hidden in, in the Bible translations, most, most people's Bible translations. In, in 1 Chronicles 16.23, I want to show you this. David used good news this way after the battle. Sing to the Lord all the earth. The word tell, that word proclaim in the Septuagint is Evangelion, evangelize, it's to tell the good news of his salvation from day to day. And so good news has several components to it. It's, it is victory has been won. The enemy has been defeated and the battle is over and you do not have to live in fear anymore. That's the message of good news. And Jesus Christ came to earth, get this, to win the battle. The battle has been won. The victory has been secured. And dear believer, you do not have to fear death anymore because he conquered death. Good news of great joy. And it should bring us joy, shouldn't it? What Mark was talking about today, joy in in the good news that Jesus Christ has come. And so... Back to the shepherds for just a minute. I said Bethlehem was only six miles away from Jerusalem. In fact, um, it's, it, it's so close that today the, the, the communities are, are, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes when you're driving between them. But these, these shepherds living near Jerusalem were performing a vital function. That vital function was that they were raising the lambs that were going into the temple to be sacrificed. They were raising the animals that would be taken in. Their blood would be spilled, poured on the altar, splattered on the altar, whatever, to make atonement for sin, symbolic of man being reconciled back to God. And so you knew that the animals you were raising as a shepherd were raised for a singular glorious purpose. And yet, This is the irony. Catch this irony. These shepherds whose jobs were so important because they dwelt with dirty animals, they were continually made ceremonially unclean. They were raising the other of the animals that allowed others to be pronounced clean, but the very work that they were doing made them pronounced unclean. So they were not able to go to the temple where the very animals they raised were being sacrificed. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? And you read the Old Testament laws and you see that. They were unclean because they were dealing with the lambs that were going to make others clean. What an irony that was. That these shepherds, it, it's almost like if you think about these shepherds, they're so close and yet so far away. You know, you watch those movies, right? And there's a chase scene or whatever, and the person makes a jump to, to catch on to something, and they're so close, and yet, well, actually, probably Looney Tunes would be a better one, right? 
And and Wiley, Coyote, whoever it is, makes the jump, and he's like six inches away, and he's so close, but he's so far away. We should probably use that one rather than something else. And, and that's these shepherds' lives. That's their whole life. The shepherds were held in such low estimation that the Talmud, you ever heard of the Talmud? That's the Jewish uh, rabbi's teachings on, on Scripture. The Talmud states that shepherds were not allowed in court to be witnesses. They were, it didn't matter if you were the most honest shepherd in the world, if you had the most integrity, because you were a shepherd, no matter how honest, how upright and just you were, you were not allowed to testify in court. That's a slap in the face, isn't it? The Talmud also says that in general, shepherds were dishonest and unclean. They were outcasts. They were on the outside looking in. But praise be to God, not this night. Not this night. They were, on this night, they were the first recipients of the good news that a greater shepherd has come. Now you had to wonder what they were thinking, right? When they were the, that they were the first recipients of the greatest news in human history, that um, that they were just these lowly shepherds. Well, verse number twelve says this. Look at this verse, and this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. This is this is so familiar to us that we overlook the significance. We we understand what what, it, what we what swaddling is. We swaddle babies so that they feel more comfortable and, and warm and safe. Um, and, and we understand that completely. Swaddling babies is a natural thing to do. Now, um, there is this really interesting Internet myth, and to be honest with you, uh, it would really preach well if, if it were true. And you may have heard this myth. If, if I'm going to blow your myth, I'm sorry. There's this thing that goes through the internet right now and I've that pastors have even talked about that says that shepherds used to swaddle the lambs so that they would not get blemishes on them so that they could go to the temple and they could um, be clean and and unblemished when they go to the temple and so the the idea is that um, Jesus, the perfect sacrificial lamb, was swaddled and laid in a manger just like these little lambs were swaddled and laid in mangers. And and it's a really cool picture, except that you can't find it in anywhere older than the Internet itself. So literally there are no historical, there's nothing in history that says that. How how many ever heard that story? I knew a few of you had to. Hopefully I didn't bust bust your myth. But um, that's not the true meaning of why there's this baby in a manger. By the way, you know what a manger looks like? Are they wood? No, they're not. That's a manger. So uh, that manger is in Megiddo. And that is a manger that there are many mangers in, in here. If you know your Old Testament history, Solomon built a fortress in Megiddo, and this is in Solomon's stables. They had 600 horses, and they had these mangers lined up there. And that's in central Israel in in Megiddo. That's what a manger looks like. They're made out of stone. Now, the significance, and I don't want you to miss this because this is what's important, uh, the significance of the manger in scene for Jesus has to do with how he was born, who he's, the family that he was born into. And uh, you don't know what you're looking at, but I'm going to explain what you're looking at. Jesus was born into a peasant's home. There are literally pictures uh, from, and I'm talking about from the 19th and early 20th centuries, all through the, the Middle East, of peasant's homes. And a peasant home is one room. And this is it. This is the whole thing. And the, the living area was here in the peasant's home. And uh, what they would do is they would bring their animals in at night, donkeys and, and that sort of thing. And they had mangers, stone mangers, sometimes hewn right into the floor of their house. And then this is where the animals would be. And this area was anywhere from two to maybe four feet lower than the living area. And so when Jesus 
was laid in a manger. He was laid in the family area of the house in an area where people would not naturally be. It was in a hewn manger, most likely hewn right into the floor of the house. And there are uh, archaeologists have, have hundreds and hundreds of pictures of this very scene. Jesus was born into a peasant's home, a one-room peasant's home. Now, I know what you're saying. Yeah, but they had hotels. They had an inn. You know what the inn was? Uh, there's, there's some debate about this, but most scholarly opinion says that a, a, an inn, the word trans, that's translated in is a guest house. And so you would have this one-room house, and you might have something connecting somewhere, and it was like a guest house, and there was a, no room in the guest house, and so Jesus' family stayed in the main peasant's home with the family, and, um, and he was laid in a manger. It's a simple domestic uh, situation here. As a matter of fact, knowing this will help you understand some of the gospel. Did you know that? Let me show you one. This is what Jesus said when he was, when he was talking to, um, in his very first sermon, he said, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Now, how can you do that unless your house has one room? See what I'm saying? Jesus was speaking to peasants when he gave the Sermon on the Mount. Later on, and I didn't put this verse up here, but there was a, remember when he healed, he healed people in the synagogue on the Sabbath several different times. And one of the times he was challenged and the guy said, well, you know, the leader of the synagogue said, you shouldn't work. And what Jesus said was, yes, but even you lead your donkeys and your, your colts out to feed and water them. And that would have been a natural allusion to the fact that they kept their animals indoors with them and then led them out. And so Jesus, that night in Bethlehem, was born into a peasant's home. We're so familiar with the, uh, with the Christmas story that the idea of God in a manger has lost some of its bite. And so um, let's, let, what I want to do as we uh, start to wind down here is I want to take us to another passage where God is presented in a much different way. And that is on Mount Sinai. And um, I think that when you see the differences in the way God reveals himself, you'll understand why God in a manger is so astounding. So let's, let's turn to Exodus 19, if you have your Bibles. And we're going to read a long passage. But I, wanna, I want you, as we read this passage, to see how God reveals himself in Exodus 19 and how God is revealed in Luke chapter number 2. And see if you can see any kind of differences. In Luke chapter 19... Uh, in verse, beginning in verse number 9, we see some what's going on at Mount Sinai, out in the wilderness. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak to you, and may also believe you forever. And when Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today. And tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down to the Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up to the mountain or to touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot, whether man or beast. He shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. That's that's talking about um, the knowing a woman because that makes you ceremonially unclean as well. And on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to the meet God and they, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. And so they're meeting God. 
Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. And the Lord came down to Mount Sinai on top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people lest they break through to the Lord and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you yourself warned us saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up lest to the Lord, lest he break out against them. And Moses went down and to the people and told them. Now, what a different picture from the picture of Luke 2, isn't it? So different. What do we see? Repeatedly, God says in Exodus 19, keep your distance. Then in Luke 2, God says, come to the manger. See the light of the world. Touch him. Hold him. Embrace him. Exodus 19, consecrate yourselves, purify yourselves, make yourselves ceremonially clean, for you are about to see God in all His purity and all His holiness. Clean yourselves up. In Luke 2, the angel tells the shepherds, come as you are in all your filth and all your stench and in every way that you have been told that you are unclean, come to Him. Exodus 19, God says, purify yourself. In Luke 2, God says, come to the one who can make you pure. Exodus 19, says, God says, consecrate yourselves. In Luke chapter 2, God says, come and kneel before the consecrated one. Not only that, but in Exodus 19, God says, keep your distance. But he says, for one particular reason, keep your distance from the mountain because to come into my presence means your death and destruction because I am completely other than you. But in Luke 2, God says, come near me for this child brings life. And in a sense of irony, it's only through the death of this child that one can have true life and true life can begin. In Exodus 19, when God appears, it is loud and violent. It is thunder and lightning. It is, it is smoke, people shaking, and God's voice booming like thunder. And in Luke chapter 2, the silence is only broken by the cry of an infant. An infant who will grow up to be a man who in the silence and stillness of Calvary, and then the cry will come, all of a sudden, it is finished. What a difference those two passages of Scripture make. Don't they? Thank God for God in the manger. Good news of great joy. So we see in Exodus 19 a picture of the transcendent, all-powerful God. In Luke 2, we see a picture of eminence. or that's, that's a word that means nearness. That God has come to earth and He says, Come! Come to the manger. Come, kneel beside this infant child who says, Fear not, this is good news. You know, there's something about infants that disarm us, doesn't it? Don't they? I, I have uh, my infant granddaughter coming in a few days. I can't wait to hold her. Her favorite grandpa is going to be holding her. <laughs> she doesn't know that now. But there's just something about an infant, isn't it? I remember uh, when my uh, youngest son was born, I was in seminary and, and working a lot. I could guarantee myself a great nap when he was napping. I was holding him. You ever done that? Of course you have. Because infants just completely disarm you. And the fact, think about this, don't miss this. The fact that God would come in such a way that he could be taken up into the arms and held to ultimately bring innocence and purity to our lives, ultimate hope. This brings us to the final message in verse number 14, which says this, Peace among those with whom He is pleased. Now that implies 
that God is not pleased with everyone. So that begs the question then, how do you obtain the pleasures of God? How do you obtain the pleasures of the Lord? How do you get this peace that the angel talks about? It is by repentance and faith. Faith in Christ alone. His death and burial and resurrection. But when you hear the word peace, you have to think about it biblically. For in our day, peace is very shallow. We understand it uh, very shallow in our understanding. It's the absence of conflict. It's the absence of noise. Uh, it, that, that was a very peaceful place. That child is sleeping very peacefully. Um, I feel at peace. And it's all about feelings. But the message of peace from the Bible is that you have peace with God because the Bible says that before salvation, you, whether you know it or not, you are at war with God and you will lose that war. Nobody wars against God and wins. And so Jesus Christ came down to earth to be God in a manger so that the angel could proclaim peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. And how do you get that pleasure of God through repentance and faith. And the only person that can bring that back into our lives is Jesus Christ. This is the one who was born. It is only through God in the manger can mankind be restored to peace with God. It is only through God in a manger, only through that child laying there that night, that marriage and friendship and parenting and work and finances and anything else can operate the way it's supposed to operate when Jesus Christ brings peace on earth. Good tidings of great joy. I love God in the manger. Wouldn't it have been wonderful to see the angels announcement that day? It would have been that night, I should say. It would have been wonderful, awe-inspiring. Wouldn't it have been wonderful to hold that baby that night? I can't even wrap my mind around God allowing himself to be a helpless child being held in human arms. Peace on earth. Good tidings of great joy. Do you have peace with God? Have you made peace with God? Are you one of those with whom God is pleased and so that God has peace with you? Lord, we thank You for God in the manger. We thank You for good news of great joy. The Christmas story, the recounting of the birth of Jesus Christ is such a marvelous and, and wonderful message that we can have peace with God because God condescended to be born and laid in a manger and then condescended to be crucified like a common criminal. Help us to never lose that wonder, that awe, that amazement at what you have done. Lord, I know that there are people here who have not made peace with you, who have not repented of their sins, think the same thing that you do about their sin. They have not exercised faith in, in Jesus' finished work on the cross, His resurrection. Lord, I pray that you will give them that peace through their faith and repentance so they can experience the good news of great joy. In Christ's name, amen, 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 amen.